So last night at dinner, one of my oldest friends in the world said, we're living through one of those times that we'll look back on decades from now. And of course, that's, that's undeniably true. It's hard to look past the daily cavalcade of horrors, the dismembered bodies that just the moment before were complicated, beloved, living people. They're piled so high now that they threaten to block out all the light in the world. And yet this genocide continues to grind on day after day after 132 days with no end in sight. It's hard for the mind to attach to anything beyond this unending moment. But I believe that many historic changes are happening beneath and around these appalling crimes against humanity. South Africa's case against Israel for the crime of genocide at the International Court of Justice in The Hague is one such historic fact. It's a fact that I believe is tectonic in significance. Perhaps its impact will be at glacial speed, but in years to come, I think we'll see that it carved valleys and mountains in the terrain of human affairs. Of course, the ICJ case hasn't yet changed the facts on the ground, but it does have the potential to change what lies beneath the ground. And I'm speaking, of course, of the stories. Narratives that are already weakened by decades of being at war with reality are now being laid to rest, buried in the rubble of Gaza. Consider the case of Canada. Can this country ever again claim the role of honest broker when Canada continues to sell arms to a country, even after it faces trial for genocide, when it maintains a free trade deal and offers diplomatic cover to a country being tried for genocide? What kind of honest broker cuts off aid to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, the only organization capable of delivering aid at scale in Gaza in the midst of one of the most violent all-out military assaults in memory? In the case of UNRWA, Canada's decision to cut funding goes beyond reputational damage to perilous legal liability. Our government should now be bracing for an international legal case that I believe is all but inevitable complicity in mass starvation as a weapon of war, and knowingly creating the conditions for the spread of deadly diseases. Unlike the justification for the invasion of Iraq, we don't have to wait years to debunk the case. The cuts were justified by a paper-thin intelligence dossier from Israel, reviewed by major news organizations like the Financial Times and France 24, not a shred of actual evidence could be found. And yet Canada throws aid to UNRWA. Remember Romeo Dallaire, the Canadian Cassandra who saw a genocide unfolding in Rwanda and could not get the world's attention and the resources needed to stop it? What do we say now about Canada, a country that watched a genocide unfolding in real time, watched the country responsible put on trial in humanity's highest court and responded by cutting off aid to the victims and continuing to sell arms to the perpetrator. The myth of Canada as an honest broker in international affairs was laid to rest under the rubble of Gaza. And with it, so many other stories. From a Jewish perspective, particularly significant are the narratives that have propped up diaspora support for the state of Israel since before 1948. In the future, it's hard to imagine anyone ever saying again with a straight face that Israel's military is the most moral army in the world. It's an army on trial for genocide. How many, including the most fervent Zionists, will ever again get away with holding up Israel as a light unto the nations? That light, which Palestinians already and always saw as nothing more than the flash of a controlled demolition, that light is now a dark cloud of incinerated civilian life settling on the ruins of Gaza. And what about the narrative of Jewish safety, the ultimate rationale for the Zionist project, the idea that when the next Holocaust looms, Jews from everywhere in the world will have a place to run to for protection. Today, it's clear to anyone who still has the courage to look that this country on trial for genocide will never ever be safe for Jews. And that as long as its impunity juts defiant on the world stage, backed up by the US, Canada and others, Jews everywhere will continue to be unsafe. The cherished stories of Zionism 
are today toppling like statues, melting into air or crumpling lifeless to the ground, the blood-soaked ground of Gaza. And finally, what about the accusations of Zionist organizations, the relentless cries of anti-Semitism that ring out hour after hour? They pour forth in a torrent these days, from Sija, from B'nai B'rith and the Simon Wiesenthal Center, from Hillel, from the Jewish Federations of Canadian Cities. The insistent complaint that every kafia, every chant in every demonstration, every public statement in support of the Palestinian people, that every one of these expressions of human solidarity is anti-Semitic. That, unfortunately, is a story that has yet to be toppled, despite the fact that Israel is being tried for genocide. But that story is so tired, and everyone is so tired of being battered by it and by the hyper-entitled victimizing victims who wield it as a rhetorical cudgel. So tired of the bludgeoning brigade of cry bullies. International law, I'm afraid, does not have provisional measures with the power to rein in that exhausting refrain. But you know what does? Organizations like ours, the Jewish Faculty Network, and others like Independent Jewish Voices and Jews Say No to Genocide, we have that power. Only we, speaking as Jews, can patiently but relentlessly restore sanity to the conversation about anti-Semitism. Only we can stop its use to silence criticism of Israel and solidarity with Palestine. We can and must restore it to its place as a racism among other racisms, as a non-exceptional form of hatred that must be fought like all racism by a broad coalition, an anti-racist movement for justice, a big, bright, fierce, and loving movement in which we take our place not as the chosen people, but as people who choose to be one among many. Thank you.